Uh, basically, I'll start by making some general observations about the relationship between science and religion. Uh, then I'll outline a program of science education that can be pursued within ISCON. And finally, give some practical ideas as to how that might be uh, implemented. So, to begin with, uh, there, for the last few <coughs> centuries or so, there has been a famous conflict between science and religion. Uh, science is a system of thought which aims at explaining everything that exists on the basis of uh, certain fundamental assumptions. Uh, the primary assumption guiding scientific research is that everything happens mechanically, that everything is based on inanimate uh, material entities that are interacting with one another according to certain laws. One of the basic principles of science from the very beginning of modern scientific development has been to try and explain things as much as possible without bringing God into the picture or without mentioning anything supernatural. And supernatural, by definition, means anything that doesn't work according to uh, understandable mechanical processes. So this is the, the basic aim of science. The scientists are uh, attempting to explain everything within reality. Uh, they're not content to simply limit their endeavors to particular uh, fields, such as electronics, let us say, where obviously there's been great uh, success. But they want to explain everything. They want to explain the universe, uh, where it came from, what it is, uh, what's going to happen in the future. They want to explain what life is, its origin, the nature of life. They want to say what the mind is, what thinking is, and so forth. Uh, so they want to explain everything. Now in this regard, science is overlapping the province of religion, because religion has also traditionally been an effort to explain everything, uh, everything within reality. So the basic concept of religion, of course, has been that the original cause of all causes is something that is ultimately beyond our comprehension. In other words, God is a chintya, uh, inconceivable. We can understand God to some extent. God is also beyond the material world, beyond the reach of material senses. And ultimately, everything that is happening within uh, the universe has been brought about by divine will. That's the basic approach taken by religion. So you have an inevitable conflict, then, between science and religion. So uh, there have been various responses to this conflict over the years. And basically, they can be divided into uh, two categories, which you could call uh, accommodation and fundamentalism. So the uh, approach that you could call accommodation is that Religion yields to science. And this is typically pursued by people in the religious domain. Uh, scientists, per se, have traditionally not been too concerned about religion. At least many of them don't particularly worry about it. But many people in uh, different religious organizations have worried about the conflict between science and religion. So I brought along a couple of, of examples illustrating <coughs> the approach of accommodation. Uh, for example, here is a papal encyclical, Humani Generis, which was issued August 12, 1950, on the subject of uh, Darwinian evolution. And the Pope said here, the teaching of the church leaves the doctrine of evolution an open question as long as it confines its speculations to the development from other living matter already in existence of the human body. In the present state of scientific and theological opinion, this question may be legitimately canvassed by research and by discussion between experts on both sides. So this sort of leaves the, the ultimate decision open, but you can see the trend which this uh, decision is uh, precipitating, namely that 
Darwin's theory of evolution will be accepted in the Roman Catholic Church. In fact, it has been pretty solidly accepted. There's a uh, papal uh, Pontifical Academy of Science in which uh, there are many eminent scientists, some Catholic, some not Catholic. Uh, basically, this is funded by the Vatican, and they engage in many discussions. I have a little article about them here. Basically, they're talking about uh, evolution and different uh, issues concerning exactly how evolution has taken place according to the Darwinian uh, theory. The Darwinian theory of evolution, by the way, is fundamentally a mechanistic explanation of the origin of life. So that's one example. Here's another interesting example. This is the uh, Chicago Center for Religion and Science. Uh, they're quite active. This is their journal. Here's uh, one article. Did homo religiosus emerge from the evolution of the brain? <laughs> uh, in a word, yes. <laughs> so he goes on to discuss this. Uh, that's the basic theme of this uh, group of scholars. Uh, by the way, the, here's a little fundraising letter from the Chicago Center for Religion and Science. The center is designed to be a self-supporting operation. The budget for the first year is about $800,000. We've already received commitments of about 50% of this budget. So he's inviting uh, donations here. So. Even the accommodational approach requires funding. <laughs> so that has to be considered. <laughs> so uh, this approach of accommodation is very standard. Practically all of the so-called mainline Christian denomination, denominations have followed that path. And this began back in the latter part of the 19th century. For example, there's an interesting book entitled Darwin's Forgotten Defenders, which explains how uh, a number of very prominent theologians, basically Protestant theologians in America, based in universities like Yale and Princeton and Harvard, went over to the side of Darwinism in the latter part of the 19th century. And that's been the dominant uh, trend uh, in the mainstream denominations ever since. So, the other approach to science versus religion can be called fundamentalism. Now, according to that approach, science yields to religion. And this is considered to be anathema by scientists. Uh, they have many harsh words to say about fundamentalists. <laughs> However, uh, some Christian groups have organized along these lines. For example, here's the Creation Research Society Quarterly, which is a magazine devoted basically to overthrowing Darwin's theory of evolution and establishing certain basic elements of the uh, Christian uh, worldview. So the basic approach in fundamentalism uh, usually is that religion is based upon revealed knowledge, uh, it is based on the authority of some scripture, in the Christian case that would be the Bible, and the idea is that if science is disagreeing with that, then there must be something wrong because the scriptures are coming down from God. How could God be mistaken about things? If we accept that God is mistaken about things, then how can we maintain our religious faith? So the basic point of view of the fundamentalists is that since uh, scientific issues, by their very nature, uh, are doubtful, uh, science, after all, is a human endeavor. It's based upon the uh, fallible human senses and human, and human reasoning processes. So given that the conclusions of science are not final, and given that we have a fundamental conflict between science and what we understand to be revealed knowledge coming down from God, well, perhaps the scientists are a bit mistaken. So let's investigate that and point out some of the, the defects in the scientific theories and try to arrive at a more reasonable picture of, of reality in which our scientific knowledge agrees with our revealed knowledge. So basically that's what the people behind this magazine are trying to do. 
Primarily, they look into, for example, archaeological evidence and things of that nature to show that Darwin's theory is wrong and to support an idea of divine creation. So uh, these are the, the two basic uh, approaches which are uh, prominent. So, uh, what I'm going to be talking about today primarily is the approach that we can take within ISCON uh, for science education. Basically, we're fundamentalists. Uh, after all, uh, Srila Prabhupada's basic teaching is that the Vedic Shastras are revealed knowledge descending from God through the system of disciplic succession. He certainly said that we should accept the Vedic Shastras as revealed truth. So we're fundamentalists in that sense. Uh, so that means, or at least that suggests, that we have to take a fundamentalist approach to the question of science versus religion. Now, in fact, one point I'd like to make is that this question of science and religion can be a strong point both in our preaching and our, in our educational system, rather than a weak point. If you uh, just look superficially at the relation, say, between science and Krishna consciousness, you may get the impression that science is a vast monolithic edifice of solidly established factual <coughs> knowledge, which can hardly be challenged. It seems very solid, very uh, thoroughly uh, supported. Uh, in fact, if you uh, look at the question more carefully, you'll see that that's not really so. So a basic principle here, as I mentioned before, is that the, uh, the scientists are also fallible human beings. It is very common for scientists to accuse religious people, especially fundamentalists and creationists, of trying to uh, warp the scientific truth based on their religious beliefs. The idea is that if a person is motivated by religious beliefs, then such a person cannot be actually an authentic scientist because his conclusions will be biased by his belief system. There's this word true believer. A true believer cannot be a scientist. In fact, one of the creationist publications that I have uh, reviewed several cases in which people were kicked out of university positions because it was found out that they were creationists. And the idea was, well, they're biased. They're true believers in something unscientific. Therefore, kick them out. Well, the point can be made that scientists are also true believers. So what applies to the religious people also applies to science. Uh, if you canvassed different scientists, you would find that scientists tend to very strongly believe in their different basic theories, such as the theory of evolution, for example. Uh, typically, they believe very emotionally in these uh, theories. So if uh, religious bias can cause one to warp one's presentation of the facts, then scientific bias can also cause a similar warping. And at the very least, it would be good to have a pluralism of ideas in which people are warping things in various directions <laughs> so that uh, people will at least have a choice to make in order to decide what to believe. Not that everything should be dominated by people who are always warping things in one direction. So that's a basic argument can, that can be made for this approach, even for those who don't accept many of our basic premises. So uh, over the last number of uh, few years, we have been doing some research on this topic of science versus religion, and I brought along some show and tell items here, and <laughs> I will also uh, explain how some of these materials that we've produced could be uh, converted into a curriculum of courses on a number of different levels. So. Uh, I have some topics for courses here. I'll just go through some of these briefly. Uh, first of all, in what it would be called life sciences or biology, uh, there's the subject of the uh, 
origin of life and the evolution of species. This is a very basic topic. We have a lot of material on that. Of course, you may have recently seen a brief volume <laughs> that we <coughs> recently published. Uh, actually, in writing this book, we made an arbitrary cutoff point of a thousand pages because we thought, you know, physical restraints on bindings of books <laughs> would make it really impractical to go beyond that. <laughs> so, uh, basically, the, the premise we had in doing the research for this book was that we wanted to take a particular uh, field of uh, evolutionary study, which was fairly circumscribed, so that we'd have a chance of thoroughly researching it, and investigate that to see what the real story was. <coughs> so we took the subject of human evolution because, first of all, uh, people are most interested in human origins, and secondly, because that's fairly circumscribed. So the book is basically divided into two parts. One part is a review of the accepted evidence for human evolution. And the other part is a review of anomalous evidence that we discovered in our research. Now this word anomaly is quite useful. Uh, an anomaly is something that doesn't fit in to a given prevailing theoretical uh, view. So whether something is an anomaly or not depends on what your theoretical viewpoint is. For example, at one time the idea that rocks can fall out of the sky was considered to be an anomaly. Uh, scientists back in the uh, 18th century maintained that, well, of course, there are no rocks in the sky. The sky is empty. It's a vacuum in outer space. So therefore, rocks can't fall from the sky. And if farmers report that these land in their fields and so forth, then obviously these people are ignorant, unscientific fools. So later on, uh, the rocks from the sky ceased to be an anomaly and they became known as meteorites. And it was accepted that there are rocks in the sky after all. And sometimes they fall down on the Earth. So an anomaly is something that doesn't fit in with the accepted theoretical viewpoint. We found that there's a tremendous mass of anomalous material, which is contrary to the accepted uh, theory of human evolution. Uh, and as I say, we had to make an arbitrary cutoff point in presenting this evidence, we could go on much uh, further. So this material can be presented in the form of courses on different uh, levels. Actually, even in the course of our book publication efforts, we have a uh, condensed version of the book for popular sales. Uh, so uh, different levels of uh, education would begin, let us say, at the uh, junior high school level. One can imagine uh, a general science type course, which would incorporate some of this material. On a more advanced high school level, one could have different courses uh, covering some of the topics that I'm going to be mentioned, mentioning. Then there is the college level. Uh, it would be good to establish a uh, Vedic university or college. So on the college level, one could have courses going into much greater depth in these topics. And finally, there's the graduate <coughs> research level. Uh, basically, the research done for this book is certainly the equivalent of a PhD thesis, or a couple of PhD theses. <laughs> and in fact, more research can go on. Typically, what happens in the scientific world is that a theory is sustained by a research community. Uh, it's not that theories just exist in a vacuum, but what you have is a body of scholars who are training up students who will become their successors. And then they in turn train up another generation of students and so forth. And so in this way, the particular theoretical view is uh, sustained. It's very similar to the Param Para system. So it would be good if we can also establish uh, such a system, because it's also observed but if, say, one author writes a book, and then that's the end of it, then eventually you have a dusty book with yellow pages sitting on a library shelf somewhere, 
and nobody knows what it is until later some other scholar happens to discover it and say, wow, look at what this fellow wrote back a uh, hundred years ago. But in that case, the, the knowledge tends to become lost. So, uh, by the way, uh, just as a matter of interest, this is the uh, German edition of Forbidden Archaeology, Verboten uh, Archaeologie. <laughs> so, we're in the process of bringing out this book in uh, many different languages also. Uh, this is also uh, an international endeavor we're engaged in. That's in its second print now, yeah? Uh, pardon me? That one is in its second print now. I believe so. Next, it's all 3,000 since it was... Yeah. This was published by a, a German company, Bettendorf. Is, and that, is that the original? Or is it bridged? Or? It's abridged. Yeah, they, they abridged it themselves, actually. So, one topic then is evolution. Uh, another point to make about the whole topic of forbidden archaeology is that it ties in with Vedic chronology. One of the striking features of Vedic chronology is that it maintains that human beings have been in existence on this planet for millions and millions and millions of years. And that's quite contrary to the modern evolutionary picture according to which uh, anatomically modern human beings have only been in existence for about 100,000 years. Before that, you had the Neanderthal man, the archaic Homo sapiens, the Homo, uh, Homo erectus ape man, and so forth, going back to the apes. So in this book, Forbidden Archaeology, we document extensive evidence indicating that human beings have been on this planet for, well, let us say there are two categories of evidence there. Evidence from scientific reports published in official scientific journals and discussed <coughs> in official scientific uh, conferences takes the human presence back to about 55 million years ago in what is called the Eocene period, at which time, by the way, apes supposedly didn't exist. Also, <coughs> monkeys supposedly didn't exist. The only primates existing at that time were uh, prosimians, like uh, lemurs that you find in, in Madagascar. But yet humans existed then. We have uh, good evidence of that. Then a second category of, category of evidence would be what we call the extreme anomalies. Uh, this is evidence that generally has been shunned by scientists. Uh, the source for this kind of evidence typically would be uh, individuals, coal miners, uh, little old ladies who happen to make discoveries and report them in the newspapers and so forth. But there you find evidence for civilized human beings going back hundreds of millions of years. For example, it seems that in the old days when coal was mined by miners going down there with pickaxes uh, in the mines, uh, artifacts would occasionally be found in the coal. And Typically, this is carboniferous coal dating back to 250 million years ago. Now, at that time, supposedly, there were no mammals. In fact, there were no reptiles. <laughs> there, were, there were only amphibians that sort of looked like alligators. So, uh, then, of course, there's our pre-Cambrian evidence, which goes back to the time before there were vertebrates, according to <laughs> Uh, standard paleontology. So you're everyone's you're the scientist's worst nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> so <coughs> so anyway, uh, on this topic of uh, life and evolution, uh, another subheading would be uh, the alternative theory for the origin of the human race and of other species of life. Uh, of course, the uh, Bhagavatam describes how human beings are descended from demigods. Now, one might think, well, now, how are we going to present something like that? This seems to be a very difficult uh, topic. However, this uh, can be presented, and it can be made into a, a, a strong point. The basic principle in the what you could call the Vedic theory of creation is that Spiritual form generates subtle form, and then subtle form generates gross form. As far as scientific investigation is concerned, 
a transition from subtle form to gross form is something that can be looked at from an empirical point of view. It's more difficult to investigate the transition from spiritual form to subtle form. Of course, going from spiritual to subtle, you have Brahma being born from Garbhadakasha Vishnu. That would be difficult to investigate scientifically. But going from subtle form to gross form, uh, it turns out that there's a lot of evidence which is readily available which supports the basic principle that some kind of intelligently guided subtle powers exist which can manipulate gross matter. Uh, we've done quite a bit of research in this area and we're coming out with a, uh, a book on this subject. One area of uh, empirical evidence is so-called miraculous healing or psychical healing in which it turns out that uh, very severe diseases uh, suddenly are cured uh, in connection with some supernatural agency. Uh, I'll give you just one example of that. There's a place called Lourdes in France. Uh, those who speak French will know that that's not how it's pronounced. Uh, I learned that when I spoke about this in France once. <laughs> but uh, Lourdes is associated with an appearance of the Virgin Mary back in about 1849. And since then, there have been miraculous healings reported there. So there is a, uh, uh, an official group of doctors who are based there who study these miraculous healing cases. And they have been able to pick out about 60 cases out of over 6,000 in which there is very good medical documentation indicating what happens before and after. And basically what you have is the uh, more or less sudden reconstruction of destroyed organs and uh, tissues. Uh, for example, there was one man named something like uh, Vittorio Michele who uh, had a cancer which was eating away the uh, ball, and, ball and socket joint of the hip. It destroyed the upper part of his femur and part of the hip bone. And also he was dying because this cancer was extending throughout his body. So as a last resort, he was taken to Lourdes. Uh, they dunked the people there in a spring considered sacred to the Virgin Mary. And he said that suddenly he felt great. His appetite came back, and he wanted them to take the cast off. He had a big body cast, uh, because his whole leg was disintegrating, basically. Uh, it turned out that he had a, uh, a new uh, ball and socket joint. Uh, and he was able to walk again with no problem. Interestingly enough, the x-rays showed that the new ball and socket joint was indeed new because it was shifted by about a half an inch from the original one, as shown by the x-rays. Uh, now, this is a somewhat unusual phenomenon. It's known, for example, that lower animals can sometimes regenerate parts. For example, you can chop off part of a flatworm, and it'll grow a new uh, part. But in mammals, what to speak of human beings, this is unheard of. So this is one example. What you see empirically is that there's a correlation between these kinds of events and the idea that some a higher power is involved. Uh, and typically the subjective experience of the person undergoing this uh, healing phenomenon indicates that uh, some higher being, some higher energy and so forth goes through them. So you're using this as empirical evidence in support of the theory of uh, divine creation. The idea behind it is that if it is possible for, on a small scale, uh, intelligently guided subtle energies to reconstruct bodily tissues, then on a larger scale, the bodies could have been created in the first place by such powers. Uh, this, by the way, runs parallel to Darwin's theory, because it should be noted that Darwin never claimed to show evolution. Uh, what Darwin did was give many examples of small ch scale changes in organisms, especially uh, breeding of domestic dogs and horses and so on and so forth. And he then said, well, if these small-scale changes can occur uh, uh, within 
purview of human observation, then imagine what nature can do over millions of years. So it's a similar argument. By the way, one basic principle that we use in our analysis is a comparative approach. Uh, empirical evidence and empirical arguments are always fallible. You can never actually prove anything empirically. However, it's a question of balance or parity. If you have an empirical argument tending in one direction, to make a case tending in another direction, you just have to do as well as the argument that goes in the first direction. So in this example, if Darwin could argue on the basis of uh, artificial breeding and so forth that evolution is, has occurred, we can also equally well argue on the basis of the miraculous healing and a number of other categories of evidence that the process of divine creation has occurred. What you do is you have balance between the, uh, the two systems. Uh, this is a principle pointed out by David Hume, by the way, <laughs> the, uh, the skeptical philosopher. Also in the forbidden archaeology, it's a similar principle. We balance the accepted evidence against the anomalous evidence. And we basically ask, what is the quality of the scientific analysis of the evidence in the two cases? And we find that it's basically equivalent. And so the conclusion is that if you accept the accepted evidence, then you should also accept the anomalous evidence, in which case the accepted theory goes out the window. That if you accept the accepted evidence, then you should also accept the anomalous evidence, in which case the accepted theory goes out the window. On the other hand, if you reject the anomalous evidence, you should also reject the accepted evidence, in which case the theory goes out the window. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a basic principle that can be applied uh, in many different situations. So another topic for course material is uh, uh, consciousness, the whole question of mind versus brain. Uh, there's much that can be said about that. The predominant view uh, in modern science is that the mind is basically like a computer. Uh, this actually goes way back in the 18th century. The same thing was being taught, uh, except in those days, instead of a computer, uh, it's more like a clockwork with springs and cams and levers and so forth. But the basic idea is that the, the mind is a machine. Uh, there's a lot of empirical evidence regarding the uh, reality of the subtle body. For example, evidence regarding out-of-body experiences, uh, Ian Stevenson's research into memories of previous incarnations, and so forth. A lot of this evidence actually is quite solidly researched and can be uh, used in a discussion of the mind-body question. So this is something that we already discussed briefly in the Origins magazine. Actually, each of the articles in this magazine could be elaborated into a, uh, a course of study. Uh, another topic would be uh, physics. Now, physics is really at the very root of the modern scientific conception of things because it is physics that tells us how everything works mechanically. And by the way, that includes quantum mechanics, which is not called mechanics for nothing, because quantum mechanics also explains how everything takes place in nature according to certain mathematical formula. Uh, and these formulae deal with different uh, forces which have nothing to do with consciousness or will or uh, purpose or anything of that nature. So it is possible to present a uh, quite interesting course in the area of physics. Uh, what I would do is bring in the evidence for paranormal phenomena. Uh, and I would also bring in the physics of the Mahabharata. Actually, the Mahabharata is interesting if you look at it as a physics text. Because a lot of things uh, happen in the Mahabharata which seem to be physically impossible. Of course, this is also true of the Bhagavatam. But uh, uh, one thing that comes to mind, for example, would be Arjuna's arrows. Uh, he had these inexhaustible quivers. So where did the arrows come from? Uh, this seems to be a, a violation of the law of conservation of energy. Uh, to manifest an arrow 
according to E equals mc squared, if m is the mass of the arrow, you need an awful lot of, of energy. <laughs> but in fact, according to Vedic physics, it is possible to move an object from a distant place without crossing space in between. This is an interesting uh, principle, which is described in the Vedic literature. In the, ninth, in the 11th canto of the Bhagavatam, this is discussed. And you see many examples of it throughout the Vedic literature. So this is what Arjuna would have been doing with his arrows. That's how he got them. Uh, it turns out that there's a lot of empirical evidence in support of this. So one can show that, in fact, modern physics is not giving you the full picture of what is happening in nature. Uh, physics is focusing on certain classes of phenomena that fit nicely into the mechanistic uh, mode of explanation. Uh, there are other categories of phenomena that don't uh, fit into modern physics. So one can make a course in which one uh, discusses this evidence. Once again, it's based on a comparative study of different uh, types of evidence. Another topic is cosmology. Uh, we have one preliminary book on the subject of the uh, fifth canto of the Bhagavatam, which presents cosmology. There are many different topics in here. This material could be presented on different levels depending on what uh, degree of depth one wanted to go into in making the presentation. Uh, one aspect of this is the uh, subject of UFOs. Uh, I've written a, a book on that subject, and one might ask, well, why would you write a book on such a uh, flaky fringe topic <laughs> as this? <laughs> uh, as it turns out, as I mentioned before, whether something is acceptable or not depends on one's theoretical point of view. Uh, within sci science and within human society in general, there is what you might call an information filter, which tends to filter out ideas, uh, reported observations, data, and so forth that doesn't fit in with the accepted viewpoint. This is quite common according to human nature. So uh, what you find then is that information that doesn't fit into the accepted viewpoint gets relegated to a fringe area. And inevitably, fringe areas are populated by various irresponsible people who exploit the fact that you don't have an established authoritative system for regulating knowledge. So you tend to have controversial fringe areas. The interesting thing is that in some of these areas, there's uh, good evidence lurking beneath the different layers of controversy. And that's true in this area of the UFO phenomenon also. Uh, the UFO phenomenon is very much tied in with the, uh, the whole topic of the paranormal. And it's tied in with the siddhis, which are described in Vedic literature. In fact, it's uh, very interesting that you can make a case for the reality of the different mystic siddhis by examining uh, reports of UFO experiences uh, made by Americans who don't know anything about uh, mystic cities and so on described in Sanskrit literature. So uh, once again, this book also makes a comparative study. Uh, and it is also material in support of another basic feature of the Vedic picture of reality, namely that there are many different forms of intelligent life within the universe, and in particular, many forms of intelligent life living on or in the immediate vicinity of this planet. <coughs> if you read the Vedic Shastras, you find that human beings are always interacting with other kinds of beings, such as Gandharvas, Rakshasas, Vidyadharas, and so on and so forth. Uh, so actually, the uh, UFO phenomenon provides empirical evidence that tends to support uh, this basic conception. So this is also material that can be used in a, uh, in a course of study relating to cosmology. Uh, another topic of interest is <coughs> history. So I already mentioned something briefly about history, namely that the 
Uh, forbidden archaeology research supports the idea that human beings have been existing for hundreds of millions of years. But then there's the topic of recent history. So uh, we've been doing some research in that area. It turns out that, uh, first of all, well, there are two basic areas where some progress has been made. One has to do with the history of kings within Kali Yuga. In the 12th canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam, you'll see the dynasties of the kings coming into the Kali Yuga period, at which point they finally uh, die out. Uh, you can calculate dates based on the time periods given for these dynasties and based on the fundamental point that the Kali Yuga began in 3102 BC. So this system of dates is in disagreement with the system of dates established by modern scholars. Modern scholars have basically used uh, the invasion of India by Alexander the Great as the starting point for their chronology. They say that a certain king named Chandragupta Maurya was a contemporary of Alexander the Great and was named, known as Sandrakotos by the, uh, the Greek historians. So they make this link between Sandrakotos and Chandra, Chandragupta Maurya and then they calculate the dates forward and backward from that point. So, uh, in fact, uh, in India there are a number of uh, more traditionally oriented scholars who have challenged this reconstruction of the dates. I've investigated some of that material, and there's a lot of material that can be presented there in favor of what you could call the Puranic uh, chronology of India within the last 5,000 years. So another topic that is interesting uh, is the fifth canto and evidence for the Vedic world civilization. Uh, it turns out that if you look at uh, cultures spread throughout the world, you will find that many uh, fundamental features of the fifth canto cosmology are found in these different cultures. Uh, I recently wrote up a paper on that which I have a table of different uh, correlating features. But basically, you'll find such things as uh, Mount Meru. Uh, Mount Meru is basically a cylindrical pillar, uh, said in the Bhagavatam to be made of gold, which is on the polar axis. Uh, at the top of Mount Meru, there's Brahmapuri, which is the residence of Lord Brahma. Uh, four sacred rivers, branches of the Ganges, flow north, south, east, and west from the center of Mount Meru. Uh, there are four mount large mountains situated north, south, east, and west of Mount Meru. These are a few features of Mount Meru found in the fifth canto of Bhagavatam. You can find similar features in cosmologies all over the world. Take, for example, the Navajo Indians. Now, the Navajo Indians uh, have a central cosmic mountain. There are four directional mountains. They also have four rivers going north, south, uh, east, and west. Uh, in the Vayu Purana, it is said that the four sides of Mount Meru have four colors, interestingly enough. Uh, the Navajo central mountain also has four colors. They're not quite the same, but they're very similar colors. The Aztecs assign colors to the four directions, which are, in fact, the same as in the Vayu uh, Purana. So uh, it's a brief idea, uh, but in fact there are many points that can be made indicating that the basic uh, fifth canto cosmology somehow was spread all over the, the earth. I'll just mention one other case from the, the Sioux Indians. This one is kind of interesting. It seems that according to the Sioux Indians, there's a uh, sacred buffalo <coughs> that lives in the west and there are four ages of time. And during each age, the buffalo loses one leg. And we're in the last age, and the buffalo has one leg now. So this is from the Sioux Indians. Where did they get that? <laughs> so uh, let's see. Another topic, this is the last one that I'll mention, because we don't want to go over here in time, is philosophy of science namely basic philosophical discussion of the, the scientific process. Some topics I've already mentioned would be the, the role of anomalies, 
the defects of the senses, the information filter, and then there's the whole question of debunking and the role of debunking within uh, modern science. For example, one could discuss the history of PSYCOP, the Committee for the Scientific Investigation of Claims of the Paranormal, uh, which has a very interesting uh, history. So, uh, <coughs> what I'd like to turn to now, let's see, I'll just mention some other show and tell items. This has, this book has additional information on the question of evolution, also questions relating to consciousness, uh, some of the strange features of the quantum theory, which indicate that that theory may not be the last word in the physical understanding of nature. For those who really want to go into the uh, mathematical detail, this is a uh, book co-authored with a scientist. that deals with the theory of creation and transformation from subtle energy to gross energy that I was mentioning before. Uh, this deals with the mind and brain, the mind-body uh, question. Uh, this deals with the, uh, the topic of uh, virtual reality. It seems that virtual realities can be used as a very good analogy for the relation between the soul and the body sort of like Plato's cave analogy. That can be elaborated in great detail, and it's great fun because it uses computers and computer graphics and all that kind of thing. And models of natural selection, that deals with actually the topics in this uh, textbook that I wrote, but uh, it deals with the question of, of evolution. So I'd like to just end with a few brief words about what can be done practically to produce course materials for ISCON educational systems which would take advantage of this, this material. Basically, what this material can do is solidify people's faith in Krishna consciousness vis-a-vis -vis science by showing them that science is not actually a monolithic system that has all the facts and all the arguments on its side, but actually there are many cracks in that apparent monolith and if you put all of the empirical evidence on the table, basically what you seem to see is that this evidence supports the Vedic picture of reality more than it supports the scientific picture. This is our basic uh, claim. And we think that this can be more or less readily accepted. It's only when you condemn certain areas of evidence and throw them out that you get a body of evidence that supports the, the scientific picture. So. This basic conclusion tends to uh, convert the question of science versus religion from a weak point or a source of doubt into a strong point, both from the point of view of preaching and from the point of view of basic faith in uh, Krishna consciousness. So from an institutional point of view, what is required in order to practically implement the program of producing courses and so on using this material uh, basically, what one needs is some manpower. Uh, and manpower requires, of course, maintenance, uh, building facilities, and so forth. So one has to establish an institution. Actually, to produce all these books and so forth takes years of work. However, years of work can be divided up in various ways. If you have one person doing years of work, then that takes many years have many people, the many man years can be compressed into a relatively short. So what I would envision is that if several uh, persons were able to dedicate their efforts to the task, these would have to be qualified, intelligent persons, then under our guidance it would be possible for them to produce curriculum materials on different levels. Because uh, it's a more or less systematic, not mechanical, but uh, easily definable process to produce curriculum materials given a particular body of knowledge. One just follows the standard patterns, which are already established in modern educational institutions. So if several people could be available 
within a suitable institutional framework which would provide them for maintenance, with maintenance and necessary facilities, then uh, such work would be done. I think such an institutional framework would be necessary because you have to bring people together in one place to really work on something. If people are scattered widely here and there, communication doesn't really take place. My observation is that to do this kind of work, a lot of communication is necessary. It's necessary to have a lot of discussions on an ongoing basis so that different ideas are clarified and, uh, and so on. So uh, the, then the question of funding uh, comes in. Uh, if we look at education in America, we see that, of course, funding is required. Education is expensive. You have the state-run uh, schools, secondary schools and colleges and so forth, which are paid for by tax money. And you have <coughs> private institutions, which are typically uh, funded by uh, donations or endowments from wealthy capitalists of, of different kinds who support the program of that institution. This is also true among the Christian fundamentalist groups. And as I mentioned before, it was also true of that Chicago religion, uh, Chicago Center for Religion and Science. Funding is required, and this usually comes from wealthy donors. If you visit any college, you'll see the names of all kinds of wealthy donors on the different buildings. So I would argue that probably the sort of institution that I'm talking about should be uh, funded uh, basically in that way, and it should involve uh, systematic fundraising uh, efforts aimed at uh, supporting such an educational institution. That's a, a worthy project which could be uh, uh, pursued. So basically, those were the, the points that I wanted to, to make. I guess I should stop here. Well, I made the schedule so I can adjust it too, so you don't have to stop. Plus, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure I see our next speaker. Um, okay. Do you want to take some questions? Yeah, I can take some questions. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I just got the first. <laughs> That's why. Um, because I would like you to address one other point that you and I have discussed a little bit. So, there's been a lot of discussion in our meetings about um, young adults growing up through our system what our society offers in terms of the future. If, if such a young man or woman was interested in pursuing something in terms of science and our mission, to, uh, how could they be directed? To what extent could they be interfaced with what you're doing? Well, in fact, for someone who wanted to move in that direction, there are many opportunities. Certainly, there are extensive opportunities as far as the, the work is concerned. <laughs> now, when it comes to the, the question of practical support, of course, <laughs> my basic approach has been to depend on Krishna and live on the brink of chaos. <laughs> it's a situation well known to us. <laughs> Uh, so, in any case, this, this could also be pursued, <laughs> but there are many opportunities. Uh, this whole area of scientific development that we're pursuing uh, also involves uh, preaching to people who don't know anything about Krishna consciousness. We have uncovered a number of interesting markets, you might say, for such preaching. For example, in America today, there are alternative science movements. For example, here's the International Association for New Science, based near uh, Denver, Colorado. This was founded by an Apollo astronaut who uh, sort of, well, he went off the deep end at a certain point. <laughs> Which Brian O'Leary <coughs> is his name. Actually, it's interesting, Edgar Mitchell, another Apollo astronaut, founded the uh, Noetic Society. Uh, so, but this uh, International Association for New Science holds conferences every year 
let's see, new medicine, new psychology, new energy, environmental science, new agriculture, non-physical sciences, you can imagine what that is, new biology, new physics, and just plain new science. <laughs> and improved. I attended one of their, their meetings. They, have meet, they typically have several conferences in a given year in which hundreds of people come. They publish from each conference a big, thick proceedings volume, usually sort of spiral bound. Uh, so there are quite a number of organizations. There's also the International Society for the Study of Subtle Energy and Energy Medicine. Now these are people who are specifically studying this miraculous healing area that I was mentioning. I attended one conference that they were putting on, and this uh, British rock star got up and told about how he had cancer which was totally destroying his body. He was practically on the verge of dying. And he underwent this healing ceremony in which he said this being of light appeared, asked him, do I have permission to heal you? And he said yes within his mind and felt this radiation going through his body and the cancer was gone. This was his testimony. And then a medical doctor got up and said, well, here are what the medical records show. And in medical terminology, we call this spontaneous remission. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, there, they also hold conferences every year. So basically, this is an area where a lot of preaching can be done. Um, do the children will need some kind of degree to get into this? Or? Uh, what I would suggest as a practical matter is that things should be organized on different grade levels. So I mentioned, I think the, the earliest point at which you'd want to introduce this kind of material would be junior high school level, where you have typically a general science course, which would deal with many different topics, and of course introduce a lot of basic facts that you have to know in order to appreciate all these different points. Then. There's the, the high school level, uh, more or less equivalent to a typical course you might take in biology or physics or something like that in, in high school, in junior or senior year, or something like that. Then comes the, the college level, which I think we also want to organize. And as I said, finally, research uh, level. Can I, can I ask a question in relation to this? Right. Oh. Or it's work a little bit. I think we're aiming for the same question. That if someone is going through our clinical system, it's toward the end of it, and they want to proceed to work in this regard, it, it, should they get go to college under your, say under your direction? Should they come just to you and just study and get? I mean, or are both things options? How would somebody proceed practically? Well, what I'm proposing, you see, of course, we're starting something from scratch. But I'm proposing to develop a whole program of education so the person doesn't have to, say, go to college and then also study this material. Perhaps at present, that may be the, the path that some people would follow. Another practical point that I would make is that one can create correspondence courses for those uh, ISKCON uh, offspring who are going off to uh, Carmi high schools, colleges, and so forth. Uh, they could also uh, study in a correspondence course format some of this material. Because the thing is, if people are dispersed in various places in different colleges and so on, how can you bring them together in order to teach them? That's a practical difficulty. Of course, this requires manpower also. Just like in England, there's something called Open University, in which they have a extensive correspondence courses. And they have a staff at Open University which is busy grading papers and sending things out in the mail and so forth. And people are getting their degrees through the mail. They also have television broadcasts with the lectures, as a matter of fact. Of course, they're pretty well established. Uh, yeah? You were saying about the curriculum analysis uh, for, for grading curriculum for these mm -hmm. courses. And we're talking that they need to be some institutional setting, grouped together, and all that. And unfortunately, I was out of the room. I apologize for that. But did you mention what the qualifications for those people writing the curriculum would be? Because this is something we're thinking about, something we need to do. What kind of person? You said more or less they just follow the pattern and you would offer advice. So what is the, do they need to have a degree in biology? Do they need to just, I mean, what do they need to be? 
Well, what kind of person am I looking for? Because I want to do that. My orientation here would be that ability is more important than training. Because uh, if a person has both the basic ability and also the will to do the work, because a lot of work is involved in this, then they can make up for any deficits in training. Uh, we basic, can, but basic ability means they have a certain net to have that. High school biology and chemistry, at least. I mean, what do you? If not, great. But I'm just wondering. Just remember, uh, I, do it my <coughs> graduate I I would say. So we're talking about writing curriculum. Right. Yeah. And that's what I'm asking. Basically, some demonstrated academic skill has to be there. I would think. But not specifically in the, in the science right. discipline. It doesn't have to be. I mean, if I have but somebody who's got two years in college, will they, uh, you know, or, or is a college graduate, but isn't, or, or is a high school graduate, but you didn't. You know, Another point has to do with compatibility with certain ideas and modes of thinking. Some people, for example, just don't like science. You know, if you talk to them about science, they don't want to hear about it. <laughs> they have an emotional, visceral reaction against it. <laughs> <laughs> so that's there. Other people are into it. You need a person who's basically quite intelligent. Uh, and to assess whether the person is sufficiently intelligent really would depend on talking with that person for some period of time to get an idea of what they're able to do. Uh, and then comes the point of commitment, whether they're willing to commit to doing it. I could name various names of, of people that I've had conversations with, but I don't want to do that because. Sure, sure. But uh, basically, that's sort of the, the impression that I have that uh, ability and commitment are probably more important than formal training, but some demonstrated uh, academic performance is probably good. And ability to write is important, or willingness to learn how to write. I must admit, uh, for me, the fact is, I never learned how to write in college. I hated it. I only learned to write for BTG. That's actually a fact. Uh, in college, actually, I even walked out on courses sometimes. I was somewhat uh, an interesting personality in college. <laughs> but, uh, Just the essence. <laughs> but in any case, uh, so, uh, yeah, ability to <laughs> write or to learn to write is an, an important part of this, because it all involves writing. That's an essential skill. By the way, I'd just like to make one interesting point. Uh, in, in China, in the old days, 